to talk about the outlook because the global economy is looking up. Vaccines, stimulus, and a reopening slowly, a return to normal life, increasingly pointing to faster growth in the biggest economies. But across the world, we're in a multi-speed recovery with some serious divergences and risks. We've got it all covered in this spectacular panel. It's an honor for me to present our esteemed panelists to you. You couldn't ask for a better group to talk about what we're facing in the global economy. IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gorgieva with us, U.S. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, WTO Director General Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iwala, and Eurogroup President Pascal Donahoe. Thank you all for being here today. We're gonna jump right in. Managing Director, if you could just set the stage for us. You have now upgraded your forecast for the global economy a few times. Talk to us about why things are looking so much better than you originally expected. Well, it is great to be bringing uh, some good news. Um, uh, we have upgraded uh, the growth projections for the world to 6%, and it is on the basis of three things. One, vaccinations advancing. Two, major economies putting in more stimulus, and the United States most recently did that. And three, we all have learned to function with the pandemic still around us. In other words, lockdowns do not cause the same decrease in economic activity. But there are two things to watch. One, the virus is mutating and still roaming around the world. Therefore, we have to concentrate on vaccinations everywhere for everyone, a fair shot. Two, we see dangerous divergence with a small group of economies, the US, China, and a couple of other emerging market advanced economies, moving to their pre-COVID levels by the end of this year, and the rest of the world being behind low-income countries, vulnerable countries, tourism dependent, small islands, they are all diverging vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the rest. And uh, that has been a big focus of our meetings. What can we do? Uh, my main point here is that I'm extremely grateful to the uh, membership of the IMF for committing to provide a big boost to reserves globally, $650 billion special drawing rights allocation. <coughs> it will help these countries that are falling behind the most. Well, we'll get to that, and, and I know there's news on that today, and, and some of the other policies, fiscal, monetary, and otherwise, that can get us there. But, you know, Minister Donahoe, the managing director mentioned vaccines first in terms of the outlook for recovery. Europe, there's optimism there, too, but the speed and the strength of the recovery is a little bit of a wild card. Can you tell us where you are on vaccination and why it's been so much slower than expected? Uh, so if you look at the vaccination outlook, it is one that is going to approve uh, for Europe. In February, for example, we made use of 28 million different vaccines uh, within the European Union. By the time we get to April, we expect that to be 100 million vaccines. And the goal that the European Union has of vaccinating 70% of our adult population by the summer, uh, we will get there and we will deliver that. Uh, so it's fair to say that at the very start of the vaccination process, due to the fact that the European Union has so many different countries within us, and we were centralising something new for us, which was mass vaccination, and allowing that and asking for that to be led by the Commission in the European Union, we did have a number of difficulties that we needed to work our way through. But we are working through them, and when we get, for example, to the summer, we will be delivering the targets that we set, and that will create the foundation, for example, when we move into next year, you'll see the European Union uh, being able to supply uh, billions of vaccines uh, through the 50 different manufacturing sites that we have uh, across the European Union. Uh, so we're making good progress, and I think that is a reason for optimism regarding the ability of Europe to make progress in the face of the challenges described by the managing director a moment ago. Even bigger vaccine challenges, Director General Dr. Ngozi, around the world on vaccines. You've been focused on this issue of vaccine inequity. How long do you think it's going to take to get some sort of global herd immunity, where, where at least we can get a majority of people in countries around the world access to the vaccine so that we can all return to normal life? 
Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, if we continue uh, with the inequality in vaccine access that we have now, it will take a long time. Because uh, you, you, you have to look at the, the numbers. Of the vaccines that have been uh, administered so far, 0.1% have gone to low-income countries, about 86% to, to high and upper middle-income countries. So if, if we don't do something to change the pace at which uh, the, the poorer countries are getting access to vaccines, it will take a long time to get to mm -hmm. herd immunity uh, for the world. And, and this is uh, really in the self-interest of everyone, every country, because we know, um, as, <clears throat> as the managing director, Kristalina, said, there are mutations, variants are coming up. And if we don't act fast, we might have the rest of the world that has been vaccinated might see the gains they've made reversed. So I think it will take a long time unless we do something fast to reverse the inequality. And that means upping volumes of production of vaccines and allowing better manufacturing access to developing countries, uh, uh, distributing manufacturing capacity uh, wider than we have now. Chair Powell, the U.S. is, is going fast. And, and is the driver of optimism in the global economy right now, thanks to three pharmaceutical companies, thanks to a lot of fiscal stimulus, and of course you and your team at the Federal Reserve. We just got a great jobs report, a record services number. How strong of an outlook of a rebound are we looking at for this year? So thank you, Sarah. Uh, so there are a number of factors that are coming together to support a brighter outlook for the U.S. economy, uh, which looks like faster recovery and economic activity and job creation. I'd point to substantial fiscal support, vaccination now moving quickly and on track to allow a full reopening of the economy fairly soon. We vaccinated at least over 100 million Americans have had at least one vaccine. Over 60 million are fully vaccinated, and we're doing something like 3 million per day. So that's moving right along. And of course, monetary policy is still supportive. And we got a taste of what faster progress will look like with the March employment report close to a million jobs, particularly if you add in the uh, revisions for January and February. And we want to see a string of months like that so we can really begin to show progress toward our goals. Um, the recovery, though, here remains uneven and incomplete. The burden is still falling, falling on lower income workers. The unemployment rate in the bottom quartile is still 20 percent. There's still eight and a half million people out of work. Uh, and this, this unevenness that we're, that we're talking about is a very serious issue. Um, it, uh, vac viruses are no respecters of borders, and until the world really is vaccinated, uh, we're all going to be at risk of, uh, of new mutations, and uh, we won't be able to really uh, uh, resume activity uh, with confidence all around the world. So it's not only the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do, as, as the Director General just said. When you, talk, when you think about, Chair Powell, the substantial progress that you'd like to see. You, you mentioned a number of the economic indicators. Do you pay attention to what's happening with the globe, with, with what the three other panelists were just describing in terms of the speed of vaccinations, the speed of recoveries? They're not doing as much on the fiscal front as we are here in the United States. Does that matter for how fast you are going to start the exit strategy, start talking about tapering and the paths from normalization? Well, so what we've said about, uh, about our asset purchases is, is that they would continue at the current pace until we see substantial further progress toward our goals. And that will really mean actual progress. We're not looking at forecasts for this purpose. We're looking at actual progress toward our goals. So we'll be able to measure that. That's uh, inflation. It's also maxim the, the indicators of maximum employment. I would look at global vaccination as, uh, as, as a risk, really, uh, to something to weigh in as a risk to, to uh, the progress that we are making. So it's something that we track very carefully, of course, and call out as a risk. And by the way, there's a risk here in the United States as well. Cases are moving back up here. And so I would just urge that, uh, that people do get vaccinated and continue socially distancing. We don't, we don't want to get another outbreak, even if it might have less economic uh, damage and kill fewer people. It'll slow down the recovery. Managing Director, Kristalina, how, how how long should central bankers like the Fed chair stay in this emergency support mode? Let me praise both central bankers and finance authorities. In this crisis, they acted swiftly, decisively, and on a large scale. Uh, globally, we have $16 trillion of fiscal measures and the equivalent of $10 trillion in what central banks have done as accommodative policy and support for the economy. 
that has helped and it should be continued until we have a durable exit from the health crisis. Why? Because premature withdrawal of support can cut the recovery short and that would mean all the benefits we have built putting a floor of the economy to be potentially lost. I want to make two pleas. One is to recognize that this year, next year, vaccine policy is economic policy. Uh, and uh, it is even a higher pro priority than the traditional tools of fiscal and monetary policy. Why? Because without it, we cannot turn the fate of the world economy around. And it is, as uh, uh, Chair Powell said, smart policy. We calculated at the fund that between now and 2025, we will add $9 trillion to global output if everybody is vaccinated mm -hmm. faster. And the other interesting piece of this is 60% will go to the developing and emerging market economies. 40% of the benefit would go to advanced economies and that would translate into $1 trillion additional tax revenues in advanced economies. I cannot think of a better value for money this and next year than investing in accelerated vaccinations. And only then Chair Powell can think seriously <laughs> about <laughs> exit uh, strategy uh, which, by the way, uh, of course, matters tremendously for the United States. It matters for the rest of the world. Uh, strong growth in the United States has positive spillover impact. Uh, with the same token, if there is a uh, gradual uh, change in financial conditions uh, in the world, that may be tough on countries that are falling behind. This multi-speed recovery bears some risks for uh, financial stability. What is the key to it? Put an end durably to the health crisis. So we're talking about the sort of three, three pillars of fighting the, the pandemic and, and the economic pain that's out there. Minister, we talked to you about vaccines in Europe. The ECB has also been innovative when it comes to its policy and pledged full support. And, and then there's fiscal policy, and there has been some stimulus there, but, but not as much as the United States, which I know you hate that comparison. Is there scope to do more, and, and why haven't you gone bigger on that front? Well, thanks, Sarah. And uh, I mean, of course, it's always valuable to make comparisons between what different parts of the world are doing, because we can learn from each other, we can calibrate our efforts, we can look whether we are uh, all doing enough. Um, if you look at the figures for last year, it would have indicated that the United States was involved in discretionary fiscal stimulus measures worth around 10% of their national income. And the euro area at the same point was involved in measures of around 8% of our national income. So there was a difference and that has to be acknowledged. But in addition to that, we would have had uh, social insurance systems within the European Union that would have been providing payments to any of our, many of our citizens automatically. And that also played a really important role in supporting the European economy across 2020. And as we look into 2021, Sarah, and the period ahead, I mean, there are many things happening in Europe at the moment that will be at the heart of driving our recovery. Uh, we have coming up very soon, the Recovery and Resilience Fund. Um, and as you know, the Recovery and Resilience Fund is a very, very large expenditure and grant programme commonly funded by the European Union. The kind of an initiative which before the pandemic would have been unthinkable. That's going to be happening later on this year. And member states are adding to that initiative within the European Union by their own budgetary decisions. So that combined with a vaccination programme, which is accelerating as we speak, does mean that as we move through this year and into next year, you will see Europe move ahead and you will see our recovery gather pace. And as we are doing that then, we have to be very conscious, which we are, 
of the global responsibilities that have been touched on by the other speakers in the panel and how Europe can continue to contribute to those responsibilities. Director General, trade contracted 5% last year, a sharp drop for, for global trade. What do you expect this year as we are starting to see this recovery? How strong does it bounce back? Well, thank you, Sarah. Yes, uh, a, a trade contracted sh uh, by 5% last year, actually uh, less uh, than, than we thought. And um, I would like to say that trade has been quite resilient. Even though we've had issues with export restrictions and prohibitions, you can see that during the, 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 the pandemic, um, uh, supply chains were fairly resilient. We had, uh, in spite of the contraction of trade, we had trade in medical supplies and equipment up by 16 percent and trade in uh, uh, supplies of uh, personal protective equipment up by 50 percent. So I think trade has contributed to uh, mitigating the effects of the pandemic in some ways. But of course it could do more and the good news is that our forecasts show that trade will be up by 8 percent this year. But within that figure there is a considerable divergence. We see imports and exports in North America and Asia uh, rebounding uh, quite uh, quickly and faster than, say, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. And so the divergence we see in recovery is reflected also in divergence in, in, in trade. Um, so uh, this is partly due to the fact that whereas the rich countries have been able to issue more fiscal stimulus. For example, according to the figures that the fund put out, I think it's about 21% of GDP fiscal stimulus in, in richer countries compared to 6% for emerging markets and 3% for low-income countries. So that has also had something to do uh, with the way, the weakness in some mm. of the regions in terms of the economic uh, rebound. But trade, uh, we hope, can contribute more. First, to making vaccines more available um, by lowering export restrictions, working with manufacturers to up volumes and, and getting more uh, uh, of the vaccines around the world. And secondly, I think a strong multilateral trading system can contribute so much to the international recovery, uh, much more uh, than, than one would have expected. Chair Powell, divergences is, is the, the, the word of the, of the panel so far. And, and even in the U.S., which is growing strongly and, and quicker than the rest of the world, there are some divergences. It's, it's not equal by race, by gender, by sector. You've been focused on this. I've heard you talk about it at the news conferences. What, what, which parts worry you the most, and can you do anything about it? This, what was so unusual about this uh, event, this pandemic event, was that um, it, it hit uh, companies that were in the service industries that faced the public <clears throat> with a lot of public interaction. And the people who lost their jobs to, to the biggest extent were relatively low-paid service workers in travel, leisure, hotels, restaurants, and things like that. Those people tend to skew to, towards minorities, towards women. They tend to be lower paid and have, have uh, less in the way of wealth to fall back on. So they bore just a, a, a very uh, large portion of the bur burden. As I mentioned, the unemployment rate among the bottom quartile of earners is now still 20 percent, whereas at the higher end, uh, the, the labor market has, has virtually recovered, but not for people in, in the bottom 20 percent. So we've been very concerned about this from the beginning. And it amounts to, you know, nine or 10 million people, depending on, on how you count it, who were working in February of 2020 and who, who were now unemployed. So they, they were in the workforce. They clearly want to be working, but they're not. And we will not forget those people. We'll, and we'll provide the economy the support that it needs until that job is done. Uh, the real concern, though, is that uh, longer term unemployment can allow people's skills to atrophy, their connections to the labor market uh, to dwindle, and they have a hard time getting back to work. Also, it's important to remember, we're not going back to the same economy. This will be a different economy. And one of the things we hear from, from uh, companies is that they've spent a lot of time since the pandemic arrived looking at ways to have more effective technology and perhaps fewer people. So you're going to see mm -hmm. some of that in these public-facing jobs. So uh, there will be millions of people who have a hard time finding their way back into the workforce and recovering the lives that they had just a year ago. And, you know, uh, I think it would be appropriate for us to continue to support those people. 
uh, you know, what we call labor market scarring. When people are out of work for a long period of time, the record shows empirically that their whole economic lives and, frankly, their broader lives as human beings can be damaged even permanently. So we want to avoid that. And I would say we have avoided uh, a great deal of it. The really bad outcomes that we were concerned about a year ago have not materialized. Nonetheless, 9 or 10 million people out of work, and uh, we need to keep supporting them and supporting the economy, and we will. Managing Director, did, did you want to say something about the the scarring, but also the the unequal nature of the recovery we're seeing? Uh, it is very clear that uh, within countries and across countries, the impacts of the uh, pandemic-induced crisis are very different. Within countries, it is low-skilled workers, women, and unfortunately, young people. They enter the labor market at the time the economy is in recession. They are more severely hit. And as Chair Powell said, contact-dependent sectors not only are being depressed now, but some of them would find it hard to come up. And then comes the second uh, scarring that is uh, related to small and medium-sized enterprises vis-a-vis -vis the larger companies. What we are uh, seeing in our research is that uh, there is a uh, high probability that once policy support is withdrawn, we would see companies that have been pretty much on life support falling off the cliff and SMEs are likely to be more severely impacted, meaning that one in 10 jobs may uh, disappear. So the question is, what should policymakers do? First, it is critical when we would withdraw support to at the same time lift it up to help people reskill and reprofile, move from shrinking sectors to those that are expanding. Uh, and I want to give two examples of expanding uh, activities uh, with more attention to the uh, climate crisis and more investments going into uh, the new climate economy. There are opportunities for job creation. Just take, for example, renewable energy, seven jobs to one in the traditional coal energy sector. That would require, of course, a training and support. Mm. Uh, similarly, reforestation, uh, taking care of land degradation, resilience to climate shocks, these are all labor-intensive activities. Policymakers need to think about it now, so we are able to support uh, a transition of, of, of people. And then the second issue, of course, is how we make sure that there is sufficient attention paid to a vibrant small and medium-sized enterprise uh, uh, sector. And that is more about how access to finance will take place. Uh, we are going to have a different economy. Hmm. It doesn't mean a worse economy if we think well in advance, uh, if we think about educational attainment, if we think about flexibility uh, for people entering the, uh, J the labor, labor market, uh, and if we think about where growth is going to, uh, to come uh, from. Uh, in the United States, uh, there is now uh, a lot of discussion about infrastructure, including uh, green infrastructure. This is very positive because we have to have not only support through the crisis, but also sure. injection of a momentum for the recovery in the, uh, un in the European mm -hmm. Union. There is the uh, uh, next generation EU fund with the same objective. Are, are you supporting? Are, are you going on the record supporting President Biden's new infrastructure plan, the American Jobs Plan? For, for quite some time, we have been uh, in favor of more investment in infrastructure. It helps to boost productivity here in the United States. Uh, and we think that uh, uh, adding to this uh, two elements, green and social, 
services, uh, is uh, social infrastructure is positive. Mm -hmm. We haven't yet assessed the, the plan in <laughs> terms of what may be the impact. What, it, what may be the impact on the, uh, on the uh, uh, growth projections for the United States, but broadly speaking, yes, we, we do support it. D don't worry, Chair Powell, won't, won't get you on that one. Uh, Minister Donahoe, how, how, are you, how are you tackling the, these issues in Europe? You mentioned <coughs> the recovery fund, which, of course, a huge component is green infrastructure. How, how are you thinking about building the economy to, to serve what Chair Powell and Managing Director were talking about, the workers that have been left behind. Well, thank you, Sarah. I think the first step to do is to realise the scale of the challenge that we have. Uh, and if I look at it from a European perspective, uh, across the uh, period of the pandemic so far, we've seen unemployment levels uh, within the European Union go up on average by around 0.5%. But if you're a young person, We've seen the unemployment rate for young people go up by 6%. And if you're a young woman, we've seen the unemployment rate for young women go up by 9%. And it really illustrates just how powerful the varied impact of the pandemic is at the moment. And in terms of how we respond back to something that is amplifying and deepening the risks of inequality, I think there's two different phases to it. The first one is the responsibility that we have to look to protect income, particularly the income of the most vulnerable, at a time in which the pandemic is having such an effect in our society. Um, and across Europe and obviously within America, a huge focus has been placed on how we can do that. And then secondly, to build on the point just made by the managing director a moment ago, we do have to recognise that when we are looking to prioritise a green transition and a digital transition as being the recipients of huge additional investment. We have to be aware that the movement in our labour markets to respond back to that investment uh, might not be automatic. Moving somebody from a contact intensive part of our economy, mm -hmm. for example, into parts of our economy that could be renewable, that are about a climate transition, will continue to require a really active stance from governments from a policy point of view and the focus on training, the focus on how we ensure that we don't confuse a rebound with equaling all of a recovery and the need to continue to support positive change within our economy for all the individuals uh, impacted by this, I think is the great approaching challenge that we'll all be confronted with and I believe we have the measure of and will respond positively to. I wanted to move, move this conversation to another hot bot button topic right now when it comes to the global outlook, which is inflation. And Director General, I was really eager to hear from you on this because Chair Powell gets asked about it a lot lately, says what we're seeing, what we're going to see is going to be transitory. A lot of what's happening is coming as a result of what we're seeing in supply chains, Suez Canal, global chip shortage, a lot of things that, that you're probably monitoring. Can you bring us up to speed on, on what you think that the impacts of what we're seeing is going to have on prices globally? Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Sarah. Yes, um, you know, I, I just want to give touch on the Suez Canal incident and what happened uh, to supply chains and to production around the world uh, during that. It shows you how important these supply chains are when we had the, the um, ever given that was stuck in the Suez Canal for a, a couple of days. It really held up uh, supply chains all around the world. It, uh, it held up production. And uh, so this is, uh, it's really very, very important. Uh, what we are, we are seeing is that as the developed uh, countries or the richer countries are performing better um, and their economies uh, are, are doing uh, much, much better, we, we see a, a lot of um, uh, shipping uh, going uh, and goods uh, going in that direction. And of course, uh, in, in terms of um, shipping containers, we, they, there's an indication uh, of how uh, supply containers um, of goods going to developed countries, um, goods not coming from poorer or developing countries, a shortage of, uh, of uh, goods moving around um, is, is um, part of uh, the difficulty 
uh, we are going to see as we move forward uh, looking at uh, supply chains uh, globally. So how ships move, how containers move, uh, this is going to impact on what happens to uh, inflation differentially in the different parts of the, of the world. So um, hopefully, uh, as we are projecting that um, trade is going to rebound uh, this year, um, we hope that um, this kind of uh, movement uh, will make sure that um, supply chains perform uh, the function in terms of making sure goods are supplied all around the world for production. Chair Powell, you, you've said inflation coming is transitory. Even ECB President Lagarde, I think, used your word and referred to it as, as transitory. But, but a lot of people are still wondering about that. They want to know, what does transitory mean? How long is transitory? How high would be too high for, for you to tolerate in terms of an inflation rate? Can you just expand on that? Sure. So let me just be very clear on what we mean by transitory. So there's a difference between a, essentially a one-time increase in prices and persistent inflation. And when we say inflation, that's what we mean. We mean persistent inflation that goes up by 2% uh, or 4% or whatever it is year after year after year. And that level of inflation tends to be dictated by, by underlying inflation dynamics in the economy as opposed to things like bottlenecks. So you know, the, the whole the, the nature of a bottleneck is that is that it will be resolved, that the supply side, if you will, will adapt and that therefore whatever whatever costs people have to bear in prices because supplies are temporarily tight as the economy reopens, those won't be repeated next year. We wouldn't think we wouldn't think they'd be repeated. We'd think that that's the su supply change will adapt and become more efficient. It might take a year, but that'll happen. And so that, that's essentially what, what we're saying. Remember. Sarah, that um, we're, we're uh, we've had 25 years of inflation dynamics, roughly 25 years, where inflation has been low. Uh, many advanced economies around the world, at least for the last decade, have been unable to reach 2 percent inflation. Some are actually fighting off disinflation. And that has been the dominant uh, sort of set of dynamics about inflation for some decades. Uh, and now we have a, a situation where the economy is reopening. There's a, there'll be a surge in demand, perhaps. There will be bottlenecks, perhaps. But it seems unlikely that that will change the underlying inflation psychology that has taken deep roots over the course of many, many years. So what, that's what we think. We think that, that there will be upward pressure on prices, which may be passed along to consumers in the form of price increases. We think that that effect will be temporary. Now, let me say that there's no certainty in, in this. And, and, mm -hmm if it turned out that inflation, and particularly inflation expectations, were to move up materially in a way that suggested that, uh, that, that they were being de-anchored and that inflation might move persistently well above 2 percent, we would react. Of course, that would be our job. One of our two mandates is price stability. The other is maximum employment. We don't think that's the most likely outcome, but we do have the tools to deal with that outcome. We will use them uh, to, use, to, to guide, uh, to guide uh, inflation back to 2 percent. Uh, if we if that if the need arises, but uh, in in the most likely case, this this uh, this period will show will show temporarily higher prices, but not persistent inflation. What would you do? You would raise interest rates. That's 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 the principal tool we have to it uh, is with with inflation. Yes, the traditional tool is to restrain the economy, uh, and and uh, reduce uh, and reduce inflation that way. Again, we don't think that's the most likely mm -hmm. outcome. That is, that is the playbook, though. If, if inflation were unexpectedly, counter to our expectations, to move meaningfully above air levels where we're comfortable, in particular inflation expectations. Th these days, people think that, that inflation is largely a function of, of what the public expects it to be. And we would be monitoring inflation expectations very carefully. If we see them moving persistently and materially above levels we're comfortable with, then we would react to that. Managing Director, what's going to happen to the to global economy when Chair Powell is ready to, to lift off, which he's not, and he's making very clear, and ready to talk about tapering the extraordinary stimulus? You, you reference this, but, but clearly the rest of the world is watching and feeling it. Let me first uh, say that uh, uh, to the extent that we also research what may be happening in the United States, uh, we subscribe to what Chair Powell said our expectations are for uh, two and a quarter percent inflation in the U.S. next year. Uh, and it is correct to 
connect what may be done in the United States to counter more uh, abundant expectations for inflation, exuberant is the right word, uh, then, uh, then there would be uh, impact on interest rates and that would have implications for the rest of the world, especially for, for economies and businesses that are highly leveraged uh, and that are seeing their uh, interest rates uh, jumping as a result. And this is why uh, the very careful approach that um, uh, Chair Power is taking to communicating clearly uh, is very helpful both to hold these expectations in the United States from being lifted up and also for the rest of the world to be uh, clear around uh, a monetary policy in the United States. Let me make two points on inflation. One is that uh, we are actually more concerned about uh, inflation in emerging markets developing countries mm. where the uh, monetary financing has been taking place because of the limited fiscal space and the need to support the economies. This is why it is so important for international institutions, financial institutions like the IMF to be there for these countries so they do not need to fall back on monetary financing. Some of them, for the first time, are using quantitative easing. Uh, as Chair Power would know, this is a uh, delicate instrument uh, to apply. Uh, and uh, for that reason, we are watching carefully uh, what may be happening uh, in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. The second point on inflation is that we need to remember how important trade is to hold inflation back because it allows goods and services produced at least cost to travel around the world holding prices down. And I would argue strongly that uh, we all need to support uh, Ngozi in her role uh, to reform the trade system so it delivers what it has been successfully delivering for decades, uh, a world where we can all enjoy improvements in uh, standards of living uh, because of uh, uh, getting the benefits of division of labor. Well, Dr. Ngozi, I, that's a perfect segue. I was going to ask you next. We, we still have tariffs between the U.S. and China. There's still this sort of big question mark over a trade deal between the two largest economies. W what's going to happen with that under your leadership? And, and generally, how are you going <laughs> to open trade more? It, it's been, WTO's had, a, I feel like, a rough period here in the, in the previous administration. Well, th thank you, Sarah. Yes, and um, well, we all know that uh, an open and uh, transparent and fair multilateral trading system is what is the best uh, for, for, for the whole world. And that is why it's important to support and strengthen the WTO. Uh, a strengthened WTO can perhaps help both uh, China and the U.S., the EU and the U.S., um, to solve some of the uh, problems or the difficulties with respect to tariffs between them. Although we hope that some of these, uh, in particularly the EU, uh, uh, US uh, problems with Boeing and Steel and Airbus, maybe we can come to some negotiated uh, solutions that would be outside the WTO. I think these, solving these problems is going to be materially important to boost uh, trade, uh, all around the world, uh, because uh, when the big powers have these kinds of problems, it impacts uh, what happens in other countries and what happens with trade. So um, I think uh, what we need to do is to strengthen the WTO so that uh, strengthen the multilateral uh, uh, mechanisms and trading systems so that countries can once more have a recourse, a place uh, where they can go, for instance, to settle uh, any disputes uh, to build a consensus around certain trade rules that are going to be very strong uh, for the world. And that's what we are trying to do at the WTO. We have the dispute settlement system, which has been paralyzed uh, for some time. That needs to be reformed. 
uh, because as a rulemaking organization, um, it, it's anomalous to be talking of making new rules. We're the one place where members can come to settle their disputes is paralyzed. So that's one area where we, we really need strong reform. And uh, we need the support of all the members, the US, China, uh, the EU, developing countries as well to, to make this work. Um, and and um, I, I think that uh, the, the WTO also needs to um, reform to, to get up to its rules, up to 21st century issues. Earlier on, uh, both uh, Kristalina and, and Chairman Powell talked of the digital economy. Uh, this is one area where, you know, the world is moving very fast. This is what is going to drive trade uh, uh, for the foreseeable future. And yet we don't have the rules that underpin this. So strengthening those rules, strengthening rules that help inclusion of micro, medium and small enterprises and women uh, uh, in trade, as we see women have been particularly hit hard by the pandemic. These are all areas that the WTO needs uh, reform. And finally, on climate, I mean, trade can contribute so much uh, to, to issues of climate change, to lower carbon emissions in the world. Again, we need to build the rules there that will uh, help to strengthen the system. So a lot of work to be done, a lot of challenges in order to uh, make the place a viable one uh, where big countries, small countries can settle their differences and agree on new rules to underpin trade in the world. Uh, it's going to be tough, but we hope to get it done. I was going to say, you have a long to-do list there. Um, thanks for sharing it. While, while in the few minutes left, we've been talking about all these issues that could affect the outlook, inflation, trade. Minister Donahoe really wanted to get your take on politics in Europe in particular, because Chancellor Merkel is retiring this year after 16 years. Germany faces that election in September, which is, of course, paramount for Europe. Macron faces re-election early next year. What's going to happen? Uh, well, I'm very optimistic about the ability of Europe uh, to uh, continue to be able to respond to the uh, challenges of COVID-19, but also pursue the many other opportunities that we want to on behalf of our citizens and making our contribution to a better world. Uh, you're right to say we do have some important elections coming up in what will be happening first in Germany and what will then be happening in France. But if you look at elections that have just taken place, look at the elections that have taken place in Holland, if you look at the change that, for example, has happened in Italian politics, in both cases there we've seen governments either being, um, being uh, about to be formed or one that has been uh, put in place now under uh, Prime Minister Draghi that is very committed to the European project and very committed to strengthening us. Um, and also what we have seen is the institutions of the European Union, like for example our Commission, play such a valuable role in putting together the kind of economic initiatives that are helping Europe do things which even a year ago we wouldn't be able to do. And the kind of political responses that give me that optimism would be, for example, we have a programme here in Europe called the SURE programme. And that programme now has helped pay the wages of between 25 and 30 million of European citizens during the time of the pandemic. And that shows the political strength that is there behind our response to this pandemic and so many other things. Uh, and uh, I am hopeful that as these elections approach and as others take place, we'll see this dynamic at least be in place, if not strengthened, in the years to come. Chair Powell, since we're, since we're on into 2022, uh, your term is up February 2022. Are, are you going to be the one to execute this massive challenge of an exit policy? We were a little surprised to hear that you haven't had any calls yet with President Biden. I, I don't know if that's normal or not. Hard to, hard to define after your engagement with the last president. Sarah, I, I have another massive challenge that, I, that I'm very focused on, and that is just to do my job every day as best mm -hmm. I can to serve all of the American people, all the people that we're so fortunate to serve. And I, I really, uh, I, don't, I don't spend any time thinking about that. I spend a lot of time thinking about how do we do the best job that we can. And that's, that's enough to think about. <laughs> Good answer. In, in the moment that we have left, I just want to get everybody's thoughts on the, the biggest risk to this outlook. We, we've talked about a lot of the, the issues and, and how you feel about them. But 
To use a cliche in news, what keeps you up at night, managing director, when it comes to the, the path forward over the next year or two, and what could go wrong? Well, clearly, the virus is the big unknown still. Uh, but if we set this on the side, what keeps me up is uh, missing on the opportunity for transformation towards green, smart, inclusive societies. More specifically, how we are going to deal with the threat of inequality. From history, we know that when a pandemic hits, inequality goes up and it stays up for some time. We saw it in H1N1, in Zika. Can we do differently this time around? Can we strengthen the support for people in education, health, social safety nets, so people are resilient to the next shock to come? Can we support the resilience of our planet can we do the right thing for the future generations? And can we continue to build the strength of our economy? Let me remind us that after the 2009 crisis, we made the banking system more resilient. There is no financial crisis now to a great degree because that was done. Can we have the same determination in a world that is going to be more shock prone to build resilience of people, of planet, of our economies. This is what makes me lose sleep, but also dream positive dreams. <laughs> Minister Donahoe, to you. Uh, so definitely across the year to come, uh, pandemics have shown to be uh, in our past. They've been amplifiers of risk and amplifiers of inequality. And the duty that we have to all we serve uh, to avoid that happening again and to get to a better place. Uh, tonight, though, and when I wake up tomorrow, it's about two different kinds of injections. The first one is how many people tomorrow will receive the injection of the vaccine so that day by day we're putting in place the foundation to beat this disease. And the second thing, then, is the injections of income and investment that we need to still have available uh, to, again, lay the economic foundations for overcoming this disease. Uh, and it's winning that battle every day with a particular focus uh, on our youngest who are paying a heavy price uh, for many of the public health measures we've had to put in place. Uh, but I just want to again echo what the managing director has said in acknowledging the kind of more difficult nightmares that we're trying to avoid. We also have to be aware of the positive things that we can achieve. And for example, how much we've achieved collectively over the last year in dealing with this pandemic and how much more we can still achieve. Uh, so sleep has to also be a time uh, to renew yourself for getting ready to do that the next day. Uh, these are almost like closing statements in a debate. <laughs> Director General, uh, what about you? What, what, what do you see as the biggest risk factor to this, to this positive outlook which you've laid out for trade? Well, let, let me, uh, I have two things that keep me awake uh, at night. One is uh, very trade related and, and the other one has to do with the low income countries. I think, uh, let me start with that. What keeps me awake is uh, the fact that, um, we, that the biggest risk to these countries is not getting access to the vaccines, like I said at the beginning. And then the... Um, it, continuation of divergence of these economies uh, from the rebound that the other well, better off economies are having. Um, and, and that is a, a very difficult thing to contemplate. Um, and I hope, but there is hope. We've just heard about the 650 billion uh, SDRs that uh, the fund is working very hard, Kristalina and her team, um, to make sure that uh, this is issued and that it's reallocated to the most vulnerable countries that need it. So that might help. Um, we also have uh, the debt burden, uh, the debt overhang of these countries, which has not allowed them to be able to give the same fiscal stimulus to their countries as, as others have in both the uh, uh, emerging markets and rich countries. Actually, I want to say a very strong word of praise for low-income countries. Uh, particularly on my continent, because they took very strong measures, uh, severe lockdowns, um, 
you know, and they, they suffered a lot from the pandemic. You have a lot of people employed in the informal sector who were thrown out of the, the, the ability to earn their daily living. Uh, but they still did the right thing. So my hope and expectation is that the world will realize that we need international cooperation to come out of the crisis we're in, that they won't let this uh, nightmare happen where half of the world, or if, in fact more, is left behind, and that we will direct resources to uh, those vulnerable countries uh, where they're needed, to small and medium enterprises in these countries where liquidity is needed, uh, so that we can all begin to converge in the same direction. Um, so that's, that's one, one set. I think the second set, the second nightmare I have, has more directly to do with uh, trade. And that is missing the opportunity uh, for the WTO to really, WTO members to come together to agree on the rules that will underpin uh, uh, those uh, digital, those innovations in our economy that are happening right now and uh, portend well for mm. the future, like the digital economy. <clears throat> uh, we can't get away from it. So my hope and expectation to avoid a nightmare is that the WTO will be able to make the right rules to underpin this. We'll also be able to make rules for the green economy and, and also for uh, inclusion. As I said before, micro, medium and small enterprises. How are we going to get the rules that will make sure that these participate and are included in regional and global supply chains of the world so that trade can really play that part that it needs to play for the economic rebound. And finally, Chair Powell, nightmares. What keeps you up at? Um, I would uh, first mention, you know, the nine or 10 million. I think of those people who are trying hard to get back to the lives that they had to get to uh, back to work. Uh, you may know this, there's a pretty substantial tent city that I drive home on the way f home from work on Virginia Avenue. Uh, so we just need to keep reminding ourselves that even though some parts of the economy are just doing great, there, there's a very large group of people who are not. I really want to finish the job and get back to a, uh, to, to a great economy. This, the last thing I'll mention, though, is I just think generally we, we focus too much on the short term and on uh, palliative measures and not enough on longer term supply side mm -hmm. uh, measures. In other words, we, and I think we need to really as a country, and I'm not talking about any particular bill, invest in things that will mm -hmm. increase the inclusiveness of the economy and the, the longer term uh, potential of it, and particularly invest in people so that they can take part in, contribute to, and benefit from the prosperity of our economy. Final question, mm -hmm. Crystalina, can we do this in person next year? <laughs> I very much hope that the answer is yes. Put it on and, your calendars. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm okay putting it down so we will be here at the IMF, all of us together. Best way to end it. Thank you all so much for such a lively and topical conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you all for watching us. And again, thanks to our panelists. Have a good evening.